Good morning. Higher education is more interconnected than ever before. Internationalization is building bridges across our societies through exchange programs, research partnerships, cross-border education. And yet, a growing proportion of our societies are moving in the opposite direction. In the context of Brexit, Trump, and rising populist nationalism, more people are rejecting a model of a globalized, inclusive, and open society, which is the basis of our work. This year's conference theme, A Mosaic of Cultures, offers us an opportunity to rebuild many of those bridges between those like us who embrace globalization and those we risk leaving behind. What I want to do is offer you a simple, but hopefully challenging argument. And it's going to unfold in three logical steps. Firstly, and most obviously, I want to suggest that we face divided societies across Europe. Secondly, I want to suggest that this has profound implications for our collective project of internationalization. Indeed, it's a threat to the very sustainability of our agenda. Thirdly, and most importantly, I want to suggest that that threat is not an inevitable threat, that we collectively can do something to confront it, that higher education is not passive faced with these challenges, but can respond. And the key to that, I want to argue, is a concept I want to introduce to you of inclusive internationalization. The idea is that well, as well as building bridges across our countries and societies, we must move deeply into the foundations of our societies and ensure that internationalization benefits all of those within our countries and societies. Politics today is no longer about the traditional divides between left and right. It's not defined by whether we believe in large government or small government. It's increasingly shaped by where we stand in relation to globalization, whether we embrace globalization or whether we fear and reject it. And we see that in many of the most recent votes across Europe. In the Brexit vote, there was a division between those who wanted to remain and those who wanted to leave in the most salient issues. For those who wanted to remain, the economy mattered. But for those who wanted to believe, leave, it was issues of globalization that mattered. It was about sovereignty and immigration. We saw that pattern replicated in the election of Donald Trump. The most important issues for those who voted for the Democrats were about the economy and jobs. But for those supporting Trump, it was indicators of how they felt about globalization that mattered. Trade, immigration, terrorism. And the importance of those issues was all too prominent for Trump voters. It was the same in the French elections. Those who voted for Emmanuel Macron were concerned about jobs and the economy. Those who supported Le Pen were concerned about globalization and our international agenda. It's not that the far right is winning elections. Thankfully, we learned from France, from Austria, from the Netherlands, that the centrists are holding the fort. But they are influencing politics. The far right agenda is shaping and changing mainstream politics across Europe. And it's doing it in areas that matter to all of our work, particularly in the area of immigration. Because what's happening is as the center moves further to the right, and the far right is influencing mainstream politics, so mobility is threatened. And so the politics of migration comes to dominate the politics of higher education. While we all believe that the politics of higher education is important, too many of our elected officials place it behind immigration in the agenda. And our work and our agenda is subordinated to an agenda of exclusion and control that works counter to the influences and positive effects of liberal internationalism. This matters for higher education. And to show how, I want to use the example of my own country, the United Kingdom, both because I know it best, but I think it starkly illustrates the challenges that we all face across Europe. This poster will be familiar to many of you. 
It was used by some of those who campaigned for the United Kingdom to leave the European Union. It showed people coming across the central Mediterranean and the Balkan routes to Europe in search of a better life. And it was used erroneously to say Britain should close its borders, should value its sovereignty, and leave the European Union. But there are huge consequences of Brexit for the internationalization of higher education. It risks rolling back and unraveling many of the gains we've made. In my country, we have 125,000 EU students. 17% of faculty are European citizens from outside the United Kingdom. The gains we've made through Horizon 2020, through Erasmus, may be threatened depending on legislation and the regulation that emerges from the train wreck of Brexit. And we've seen an immediate drop in undergraduate applications of 7% from EU countries in the aftermath of the vote. And this is tragic when we consider that in the UK alone, 400,000 non-British citizens are studying and domiciled in the UK. And when we include offshoring, around 650,000 students are enrolled in UK programs from around the world. The highest group come from Asia, followed by other EU countries, and then Africa. And it's important to recognize the British economy benefits. This is one of our major exports. A study by Universities UK has revealed that we benefit in five billion pounds a year in fees, but the net contribution is five times higher than that. They've also estimated that we benefit in terms of 200,000 jobs created not just in our universities, but in surrounding communities. And this is before we even get to the soft power benefits. The benefits we get from people coming from around the world to study in the United Kingdom, going back to their own countries, and having influence, and building those sustained long-term networks. But despite these benefits, our politicians, influenced by anti-immigration sentiment, influenced by a concern to rebuild boundaries, are producing what to us seem like deeply irrational policies. My Prime Minister recently said that we needed to keep students as part of the net migration figure, the figure that the tabloid newspapers and the public are concerned about, that includes students alongside refugees and asylum seekers, family reunification, skilled labor, unskilled labor, in one figure, and puts pressure downwards on the number of students we receive. And Theresa May said, students are in the net migration figures because it's in the international definition of net migration, and we abide by the same definition that's used in other countries around the world. How ironic that this is one of the few international standards she sought to maintain and uphold. And we know from opinion polls that the general public misunderstands the nature of student migration. In reality, 97% of the students who come to the UK return home. It's circular migration, it's temporary migration, and it benefits us all. So why do we have to subordinate this valuable export to the politics of immigration? I don't think we have to accept this. I think higher education can play a role in transforming the landscape. So what is that role? Well, I think we need to be more aware of our place in wider society and our role in some of the rise of populist nationalism and be self-critical. I think the voting map in Brexit starkly shows the divides in our society. The blue areas show where certain regions voted to leave, the yellow areas, sorry, the blue areas were for stay and the yellow areas were for leave. When I looked at that map, it was fairly obvious that there was a divide between London in the southeast and Scotland on the one hand and much of the rest of the country. But beneath that lie deep divisions, divisions based on age between the young and the old, divisions based on education between the educated and the less educated, and between urban and rural. Those with international outlooks were far more likely to vote to stay as we would believe. But when I look closer, Something struck me about my own position relative to Brexit. I realized that when I looked at the list of the top 50 
leave areas in the country that I'd spent a total of four days of my life in those areas. I regard myself as a liberal internationalist with a global outlook. I'm well-traveled, but I didn't know my own society as well as I thought I did. And I think we need to look inwards to the people we risk leaving behind, to the communities that may not be accessing the internet in large quantities, that may not have had access to higher education, that may not travel as much as we do. And if we fail to understand and engage that group, we risk leaving them behind, alienating them, and undermining all of the benefits of internationalization. The demographics of Brexit show that higher education is an important part of this. These two illustrations from the Financial Times show firstly a direct correlation between voting for Brexit or not and having had access to higher education, and a direct correlation between whether you have a job requiring a university degree and whether you voted for Brexit. To me, that shows that influence and coming within the sphere of a university shapes your global outlook. It defines whether you are likely to vote for exclusion or an inclusive, open, and liberal society. We collectively, you, have built a vast toolbox of ways to build internationalization. The array of strategies and opportunities available to build bridges across societies is vast. But what I want to argue is that that toolbox must be broadened to benefit those who might not ordinarily come into the sphere of a university, so that they experience the internationalization that we're offering our students, our faculty, and our staff. A few years ago, being based at the University of Oxford, which is traditionally an elitist university, I admit it, I was struck when I met the mayor of Oxford. She came to one of our events, and she was a little nervous and uncomfortable in her interactions. And I asked her if she was OK. And she said, I don't often come to events at the university. And I was puzzled. I asked, but you live so close. Why don't you come to more things? And she said, I feel a bit scared and intimidated. I was a headmistress, she explained, at a school in a deprived area called Blackbird Lees. And she said, there are boundaries of exclusion between the university and that community, as she saw it. I went away and I learned that in 30 years, not a single undergraduate has come to Oxford from that community of Blackbird Lees. And I thought we need to do much more to ensure that our liberal international project reaches into those communities. Kofi Annan, the former Secretary General of the United Nations, gave a speech at Yale University in 2002. And he introduced the idea of what he called inclusive globalization. He said something that is more relevant than ever today. He said, we need to realize that globalization's glass house must be open to all if it is to remain secure. That globalization as a project and internationalization are vulnerable if they are not inclusive, if they do not take people with us. And I think there's an analog for higher education, an analog of inclusive internationalization. What specifically can that mean? Let me get more concrete and make some suggestions about how, as well as going across societies, we can go downwards deeply into supporting the communities that feel excluded. In my day-to-day -day work, I occupy two roles. I do research on refugees and migration, two of the most divisive political issues of the 21st century. But I'm also, like most of you, a university administrator. I direct a research center called the Refugee Studies Center. Here it is. It's a small research center. We have about 30 staff, but we are inherently international in outlook. We have a master's degree for 25 students a year, 80% of whom are overseas students. We build partnerships with universities around the world, with NGOs, with international organizations, with businesses, to allow us to do research to impact on the lives of refugees. 
And much of our work tries to play that role positively in society. To give you an example of a study that will come out soon, we've worked collaboratively with Deloitte, uh, the company, in order to work on the Syrian refugees' economic lives in Europe. And we've been able to show, for instance, that despite Syrian refugees in Europe being highly educated, 38% have had a higher education of some form before coming to Europe. Around 82% of work age are unemployed. And we've been able to show some of the reasons for that. Language barriers, barriers in recognition of qualifications, barriers of access to retraining and accessing higher education. And that's an example of work that I'm very proud of. But part of my concern is that we look outwards to the international before we engage the communities on our doorstep. And so I want to suggest three ways in which internationalization can benefit those nearer to home, can be inclusive and support those who are not part of that elite, often international liberal project. The first idea I want to introduce is what I would call whole of society exchange programs. When I was 21, I was able to participate in a European university summer school. It was hosted in the Abbey at Cluny in magnificent surroundings in the Burgundy region of France by the Collège Européen de Cluny. And for the first 10 days, we spent time with other students from across Europe. We debated the future of the European Union. And that was great fun and enriching. But it was the second part of that exchange that stays with me. With support from the local chamber of commerce, we were all sent in different directions to do an internship with a local small and medium sized enterprise. And I was sent with very little work experience to a small jewelers in the town of Macon. And there I lived in the home and family of the manager in the community and got to know other members of that community. For me, it was that experience of meeting people I otherwise wouldn't meet beyond the university, beyond the student world, that has stayed with me ever since. And I think this has social implications, because what we know about attitudes to immigration is the more people encounter migrants, the more positive their attitudes are towards other people. In the United Kingdom, the people who are most skeptical about migration are the people who encounter them least. In London and the Southeast, with the highest levels of immigration, people are the most tolerant. And when you move to areas like the Northeast, with relatively few migrants, people are the most suspicious of immigration. How do we do this at my research center? Well, one of the ways we try to build that exchange is with our master's students, we ask them to engage in a group research project. And that involves field work, but at a local level. Rather than going internationally, we ask them to work with local grassroots organizations. For instance, in one such project, some of our students worked with a refugee football club in Glasgow called United Glasgow Football Club. And they wrote the pilot study up as a working paper, reflecting on their experiences. It broke down boundaries with the local community and with refugees and engaged our students in a wider societal project. The second area I want to put to you is the idea of lifelong civic education. Lifelong learning has been traditionally an important part of universities' activities across Europe. In countries such as many of the Scandinavian countries, for instance, Denmark, Sweden, Finland, lifelong learning is important and growing. In countries like the UK, it's important, but it is declining with lack of funding. What I want to suggest is, as well as providing very important vocational training, very important ways to reskill throughout your life, it can also incorporate civic education. And civic education that is international. In my university, we have people passing through that cover a range of international issues. Climate change, the conflict in Syria, development in Africa, cyber security. How can we draw upon that knowledge base and make it accessible to a wider community, whether through MOOCs, online learning, e-learning, short courses, inviting to public lectures, how can we build that base within our societies? And it matters for our wider societal context. What we know from polls like this poll from Ipsos Mori 
is that there's a gap in perception, public perception on issues like migration. People tend to overstate the part of migrant populations that are, for instance, asylum seekers or low-skilled immigrants versus the reality. And education must confront that lack of knowledge in a post-truth society. How do we play that role? Well, one of the things we run at my center is an international summer school, where every summer we have around 70 mid-career professionals come to Oxford and engage for two or three weeks in our curriculum. Yes, they come from around the world, but we also try to include people who are on our doorstep and can benefit from that knowledge. The final idea I want to put to you is the idea of public engagement with research. Research cannot simply stay in the ivory tower. It has to engage a wider public at all levels. It can do so by informing. Research is an output that can benefit the community. It can do so through consulting. We can import knowledge from our communities. But we can also collaborate and see knowledge as a joint product with our communities. A range of universities across the UK have created public engagement prizes or innovation seed funds from Aberdeen to Southampton to Kent, and Oxford is following their example. One project we've done that tries to be inspired by this is work we do in East Africa, where we've studied the economic lives and contributions of refugees in Uganda and Kenya. But rather than just turn up with a clipboard and ask questions in a survey, we've trained refugees as peer researchers and enumerators. They have become our partners in the joint production of research. And that's created opportunities for them to learn. It's created opportunities for us and our students to interact with refugees and to launch the results within those communities, to be inclusive and embracing of those that we might have otherwise studied as simply objects of our research. We've made them subject and active partners. Of those people we've trained, Many have gone on to run their own NGOs, to get scholarships to higher education in East Africa or abroad. And last week, for instance, one of our refugee researchers, Robert Hakiza, gave a TED talk of his own at TED Global in Arusha. So in conclusion, what have I told you? What we must do is build bridges, not just horizontal bridges that go across countries and societies, but vertical bridges deep down into our societies. The internationalization of higher education is built upon the foundations of democracy. If we don't take people with us, they will vote against the projects and regulatory frameworks on which our work is premised. But the clash between globalization and its implications for higher education is not inevitable. Inclusive internationalization can provide the way forwards. Thank you very much.